Uh, over the holidays, I had the uh, very good fortune to run into our uh, most distinguished uh, speaker uh, at a reception. And he explained to me that um, he couldn't stay as long as he would like uh, because he was, uh, as he put it, running between raindrops in order to get to all of the places that he wanted uh, to get to uh, that evening. <clears throat> and I was struck by his use of that particular metaphor. And as I thought about it, uh, Dr. Gee is uh, probably the only person who may actually have the energy and agility really to run between raindrops. Uh, and uh, his job is one that requires him to muster all of the energy and agility that he can. To know even a little bit about uh, The Ohio State University is to know that there is no uh, more important institution today uh, in our community or far, far beyond. Uh, it is truly a world-class uh, institution. It is also to know that there is um, no institution uh, that will play a greater role in determining uh, our future. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Gee uh, has, uh, uh, Dr. Gee has demonstrated uh, a command uh, of the complexities of the modern uh, public university uh, uh, to a greater extent than anyone who has, um, uh, at least according to one website, ever served in that position. Uh, those complexities include a mission that ranges from the one that we're used to, which is the education of students, which Ohio State does in batches of almost 65,000 at a time, uh, to conducting research that is intended to bring an end to cancer, to serving as a key driver, a key economic uh, development driver. Um, Dr. Gee's mastery of the challenges of public university leadership uh, have uh, earned him wide recognition, including in 2009, the distinction of being named the best university president uh, in America. And somehow he manages to do uh, all of this, uh, not only uh, with keeping a smile on his face, uh, but also usually bringing one to ours. And so please join me in welcoming the president of The Ohio State University, Dr. E. Gordon Gee. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, Buzz and I share one common uh, trait, and that is the fact that we love bow ties. And, and I'm always asking where he gets his, and he never tells me, so uh, I'm buying mine uh, in, in strange and exotic places. But thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, Porter Wright uh, for sponsoring this. Uh, I will say this. Uh, it's a very brave law firm that takes on sponsorship of an, of an event which I'm speaking at, so I... Uh, <laughs> So I say, say that very much. In fact, it's so great to see a friendly crowd. It's been a long time. Um, <laughs> but it's been a very long time. I, I, I generally don't see these kinds of crowds. But uh, I have brought some friends with me today, leaders from our Board of Trustees who are right here. And I'm grateful for their leadership. I truly am. And uh, members of our faculty, my colleagues from the university, uh, our staff, certainly our students, uh, uh, we wanted to make certain that the room was full. And uh, so we did bring a few people. Uh, indeed, I am told uh, students are here today in a variety of roles. Video interns taping this event for a rebroadcast. A student uh, beginning a service learning project for an English class, which I find uh, fascinating. And future leaders from the Buckeye Leadership Fellows Program. I had a chance to visit with a few, the, a few of them a uh, moment ago. Um, and it's wonderful to introduce them. I would say this to our students. It's wonderful for you to see a civil discourse in a civilized manner, uh, which is infrequent in this country right now. And so uh, I'm delighted that you're here to see that, indeed, this nation does work on the basis of conversation, not on the basis of, uh, of innuendo. And so I'm grateful that all, all of you are here today. And in the tradition of this forum, what I will do is I'll say a few things, uh, probably more than a few things. As you know, I speak very fast, so uh, I apologize. I, I, on, my, on my remarks here, they had this big thing that says, slow down on every page. So uh, <laughs> if I don't, just understand that I don't follow orders very well, as the trustees know anyway. So. <laughs> Uh, but I look forward to hearing your thoughts and your questions. Um, before I do so, though, one of the things that I, that I love to do is I receive thousands of emails, as you know, well know, 
And so I thought I'd just share a few of the latest ones with you, just to know that with 65,000 students and 48,000 faculty and staff and uh, 520,000 living alumni, you're always uh, getting some interesting ones. Uh, I'm not able to uh, read all of them, but uh, every once in a while I get one that I really enjoy. This one comes from Jackson. Um, who is a third year student. He says, I'm a third year student at Ohio State and I love it here. These all came in just this week, by the way. I want you to notice this. I just read in USA Today that some colleges are scheduling classes at midnight to solve the problem of overcrowded classrooms and the closed out courses. Please consider this for Ohio State. My friends and I try not to wake up before noon as a general rule, so you can see that midnight classes would appeal to us. <laughs> Sincerely, Jackson and the Night Owls at Taylor Tower. So I send him a note, dear Jackson, Thank you for your suggestion. If you can find a faculty member who is willing to teach a midnight class, preferably while not asleep at the desk in front of the room, I say go for it. So there you go. Uh, this one, uh, dear Dr. Gee, I keep hearing a rumor that if you get hit by a campus bus, you get tuition for free. I mean, where do these kids come up with this damn stuff? I have no idea. My classmates insist that it is true. However, an employee of the university told me that it was false. I was wondering if you could give me a definitive answer on whether this rumor is true or false. Sam, who is a first year student. So dear Sam, definitive answer, injury by bus is not a ticket to free tuition. Try persistent studying instead. Um, <laughs> perhaps alone without those rumor mongering classmates, there are such things as scholarships too. So, and then this was my favorite one. This one came in that says, dear President Gives, I was driving around campus today. I happened to see some deer uh, out near Kenny Road. I was wondering if a student like me could possibly have the opportunity to hunt on Ohio State-owned land. <laughs> I just had to respond to that kid. That was from Alex. Dear Alex, sorry, but no. Leave the deer alone. Look for wolverines instead. So there you go. <laughs> anyway. Um, as I was thinking about today, um, it uh, occurred to me that the last time I addressed the Metropolitan Club, it was October 2007. Uh, the month that I returned to Ohio State, the month that I had the privilege to return to Ohio State, I returned to uh, this remarkable state, um, to this remarkable university um, with great stores of both enthusiasm and energy. And I returned because of my enthusiasm for Ohio State, for its exceptional people, its spirit, uh, and the community in which we live. Uh, all of this was, to me, uh, uh, boundless. I returned because the scarlet and gray ties pulled me back home, and as you know, I am partial to ties. I returned because I was convinced that it was Ohio State's time. I said that at the time that I returned. And I wanted to be a part of the most exciting academic environment in American higher education, and I believe that is true today as it was then. Uh, to my delight also, I will note, and I say this to my colleagues who had the, uh, had the uh, appropriate uh, notion of staying instead of leaving for a period of time and going to the wilderness, I returned to find Ohio State a much better place, and it was a great place when I left, but it, is, it was even much better when I returned. I have often said that uh, I am a leading economic indicator. Every time I change jobs, we go into a recession, and this happened, um, this happened when I came back, as you well know. Indeed, it was not long after I returned to Ohio State that the world as we knew it began to fall apart. The housing market collapsed, uh, forcing families out of their homes. The job market collapsed, creating unprecedented uh, unemployment for millions of Americans. And yet, and yet, through all of these hardships, Ohio State has not only survived, it has thrived. There are extraordinary things happening at the university at this very moment, just two miles away from where we're sitting right now. Our faculty and our students are working to eradicate cancer, alleviate poverty, produce clean energy, make our food safer and more nutritious. Uh, they are illuminating schools in Haiti with solar energy and creating blueprints for green construction here in Ohio. I, I have to say that my enthusiasm for this university remains as boundless now as when I returned four years ago, as boundless as I believe the opportunities are before us. And yet, as you have no doubt read and seen, the biggest news about Ohio State of late, all the sound and fury has been almost exclusively about football. That, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my view, and I'm glad I'm in this room to say that, is a monumental shame. To subordinate the ingenuity of so many to the impropriety of a few seems to me an unjust proposition. In truth, a series of unfortunate events in our athletics program has masked a remarkable year at Ohio State. Now, just hear me out, for I really feel like a proud father, and indeed I am a very proud father, by the way, I am now a proud grandfather, and that is another story. 
Ohio State has had a remarkable year. We continue an impressive upward trajectory in our ranking among America's top colleges. Our first year retention rate for all students is 94%, and the retention rates of our African American and Hispanic students exceed national averages for both public and private institutions. Our academic medical center has been named among the nation's best for quality patient care. 20 of our faculty, the most of any university in this nation, there are 3,600 colleges and universities, uh, and, uh, and 20 of our faculty were elected as fellows of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, one of the most prestigious honors given in America. You might have seen that ad, by the way, in the Sunday Dispatch. We have cracked the top 10 for the first time for our institutional student, uh, or for our international student enrollment, jumping eight spots to rank seventh among the nation's colleges and universities. Our goal, frankly, is to be number one. We believe that we are a world university, not simply a world-class university. And we have students, by the way, from 150 countries, and we speak 100 different languages at Ohio State right now. Our fundraising continues to do very well, uh, despite the mercurial nature of our times, uh, setting records uh, this last year in amounts raised, number of donors, and in gifts of a historic and transformative nature, of which I will talk about later. So that's a description. That's just the tip of the iceberg. I could go on and on, and uh, sometimes I do. But uh, as we have, uh, and we have every intention on building upon these successes of elevating our academic programs and of honoring our founding promise to change lives, lead the state, and wholly realize our crucial status in this global community. I've said many times that Ohio State is the intellectual, social, cultural, and economic engine of the state, and it is, uh, without any doubt. It is both our blessing and our profound responsibility that what the state of Ohio most needs is precisely that which Ohio State can provide. We are a single-minded institution with a worldwide reach. We are about teaching and learning and the cult cultivation of ideas. We are about research and scholarship and the unlimited potential of discovery. We are about preparing the workforce of tomorrow and improving the lives of 11 million Ohioans. Which leads me to the fundamental premise of what I am here to talk about today. How do we, this is the question, how do we uh, as a world-class university finance our visionary aspirations and continue to flourish in an era of limited funding? Old models, I will say this to every one of you, old models will not survive. That, my friends, I know for absolute certain. In order for us to thrive, we need to rethink, recreate, reexamine, redefine, and reconceptualize a wholly new model, indeed a brave new paradigm for the 21st century university. I am currently chairing the National Commission on the Future of American Universities. And I will tell you, there is a fundamental and foundational agreement that we must reposition and reconfigure ourselves for the long-term benefit and betterment of our students and our world. This is a time not for timidity, but for bold strokes. This is a time for first order change. This is a time, by the way, I believe this very strongly, to blaze an uncharted path for the future among our universities and among my university. As you well know, times have irrevocably changed. Higher education slice of the pie. Our resources from both the state and the federal government is likely not to get any bigger or any more generous. Time and change demands that we must be infinitely more innovative if we are to sustain our mission and obligation to enhance lives and enrich the community. It is a new year, and that is the new reality. And it is clear that we must create a new model for sustaining our core mission then. To our great fortune here in Ohio, we have been pleased with the strong support of our elected leaders. And I want to say this not because of the fact that I am now uh, sitting across from the state capitol, but because it's true. Last summer, counter to national and international trends, Governor Kasich and the Ohio legislature honored the importance of higher education with a budget that supports our mission. In this, we are uniquely fortunate, and I am personally, as are all of my colleagues at the university, immensely grateful. All but a few of these nations, uh, of this nation's 50 states, are facing substantial budget gaps, and many have inflicted painful reductions on higher education, resulting in layoffs, construction cancellations, and campus closures. To share just a few recent examples, in California, my good friend, uh, uh, Mark Udoff is the president of the University of California. They face a $1.4 billion reduction in state support. They have let 22,000 people go from that university. 
And that, uh, it, by the way, this year is on top of uh, several consecutive years of extraordinary budget reductions in that state. In response to his copious critics, uh, Governor Jerry Brown invoked a Latin phrase, nemo dot quad non habit. I actually practiced that for a while. <laughs> Which in English says, no man gives what he does not have. All, uh, uh, think about that. That's what the governor of California is saying, the grand bargain in California. At the, that, that school up north, the University of Michigan, um, administrators faced a 15% reduction in education funding last year and a 30% reduction in the last decade. In Texas, state lawmakers reduced higher education funding by nearly a billion dollars to help close a $27 billion shortfall. And then, in what I thought was the most interesting um, uh, fact, in Missouri, Governor Jay Nixon considered asking the five state universities to lend the state more than $100 million to help balance the state budget. I do not suggest that. Uh, I want you to know that. Uh, by the way, he did pull back from that notion. But ladies and gentlemen, think about what I've just said. Uh, it has come to this. A nation that risks compromising its democratic foundation of self-governance enabled by an educated people. The truth is, we know federal and state resources are highly stressed and strained. Indeed, they are. We cannot look to them for any kind of substantial infusion of new resources. If we want to invest in new programs and state-of-the-art facilities, and I unabashedly affirm that we do and we will at Ohio State, the onus is upon us to generate resources ourselves. The pie is going to remain the same, so we will grow our portion of the pie. Around the country, the overwhelming response is one of hanging on and surviving. Get in the foxhole. Hang on. The world will get better again. It will not in terms of what we're doing. We will make the world better by our own decisions. I do believe that. So our own approach to these challenging times is something quite the opposite. In total, our financing strategies are unlike any other effort in American higher education today. That is not hyperbole. That is true. I've said before that our grand aspirations will require transforming an elephant Ohio State into a ballerina, the new Ohio State. To meet the unprecedented demands of this age, we must be more agile, we must be less bureaucratic, and infinitely more inventive. We must be uh, the architects of our own destiny, or else we will be uh, victims, I can assure you. Recently, we have achieved a series of triumphs at the university that hint at the promise and I say hint at the promise and potential of some innovative financing strategies. Our Academic Medical Center won a $100 million grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to further its work in radiation oncology. By the way, that was destined to go to Yale and the University of Connecticut, and we stole it. Isn't that great? Um, we did not steal it. We won it. We won it fair and square. I should not use that. There's someone, uh, someone will, use, will, will tweet that. And, and uh, I'll be doing the same thing I did with the Little Sisters of the Poor. Anyway, and, uh, <laughs> and I do not intend on raising money for Yale. I did enough. <laughs> In February, the chairman of our board of trustees, Les Wexter, and his wife, Abigail, uh, made a transformative investment of $100 million in the university. Now, that kind of support, both public, our $100 million grant from the Fed, federal government and private from the Wexners, signifies an extraordinary measure of confidence in the momentum of this university. It demonstrates the potential for a financing model based on seeking rewards for excellence and always, always returning support to our core purposes. Another substantial measure of our success and good health stems from the partnerships we maintain both within the institution and outside of it. I truly believe this. Instead of publish or perish, it must be partner or perish at this university. I believe the unrelenting pursuit of deeper partnerships will be the defining characteristic of institutions and organizations that thrive in the coming century. Partnership with one another, with business and community collabor uh, collaborators, such as Battelle and the Columbus Partnership, such as Columbus State, I know David is here today, with, with government, we're across the street, with parents and extended families, and certainly with our communities. Our new economic reality, challenging and calamitous as it is, has loosened us from old moorings. It enables us to reconceptualize how to fund our core mission, how to reconstruct the scale of opportunity. We made news in October by becoming the first public university to issue a 100-year bond, a century bond, that will mature in 2111. And I'm announcing today I intend on being here to pay that thing off, OK? <laughs> Demand for our century bond was so high that we raised the offering to $500 million. I'm also pleased to report that as part of this process, the debt rating agencies reaffirmed 
instead of lowering, as they did with almost every other institution in this country, they reaffirmed our, all of our ratings. Investors are seeking safe and durable investments, and they judge The Ohio State University as one of the best and wisest investments in this country long term. Quite simply, if not for the remarkably low interest rate of 4.8%, the lowest ever on this type of bond in this country, we would not have considered this as an avenue. This unique opportunity was predicated on a confluence of economic timing and our strong investment uh, strategies. Another area that shows promise and potential in generating revenue is in the commercialization of the remarkable research of our faculty. Our research program finished 2011 on an extraordinarily strong note. Among all universities in the nation, we rank second now in industry-sponsored research. Our research expenditures is now, uh, now is $129 billion. Think about that. Our faculty researchers are conquering diseases, designing fuel cells, developing new therapeutics, unraveling antibiotic resistance. As one example, and this is one of my favorites, our scientists have developed 70 new to 17 new tomato varieties since 1991. Now, you say, so what? Well, our research has helped our state's tomato production flourish into a $100 million industry just alone, which feeds into a, to a $100 billion industry. We single-handedly have, uh, have made Ohio agriculture one of the most important uh, business entities in the state. In fact, it is the largest business in the state, uh, agriculture is. But let me be perfectly frank. Uh, on the same time, we rank uh, among the premier research universities and research expenditures but we are far down the list um, in terms of the important category of commercializing our research. We are missing vital opportunities to, to transform the magnificent brain power centered at our university into products and processes that will create new businesses, generate resources, and improve lives. This past spring and summer, we began a very proactive approach to technology commercialization. We were assembling a new team to advance our most promising technology. We hired a new leader, Brian Cummings. Brian comes, comes to us uh, from Texas and then from the University of Utah, where he just recently came, where he took Utah to the number one spot for startup creation in this country. We created a new Office of Technology Commercialization to foster an entrepreneurial culture and, coordinating, um, and to coordinate technology development. Located in the South Campus Gateway, by the way, it's going to be open to everyone. The new office will be the home base for research development, the mother of all research at our university. We have started a new open pitch event to engage the entrepreneurial community called Wake Up Startup. By the way, I'm told the first three of these events were absolutely sold out. We have formed a student commercialization board to create more robust and interactive student programs. Our students are among our most innovative and creative, as you well know. And I'm happy to report we have launched our first three, our first three high value startup companies. It is not just about generating revenue, it is about building a robust, a robust program, developing the next generation of entrepreneurs, connecting brain power and the power of industry. In this new era, we must examine everything we do, think hard about how this university operates each day, and ask ourselves whether certain assets, whether certain assets advance our mission. In the new world, there can be no sacred cows. I often love to say the sacred cows make the best hamburgers, but but the only sacred cow at my university is the fundamental purpose of that university. We are asking questions about many things previously considered sacrosanct. Do we need an airport? Do we need a golf course? Do we need so many ancillary pro uh, properties around the state? Because it does, because, and I, and I want you to think about this, because if it does not touch the heart, if it does not touch the mind, if it does not touch the soul, if it does not reveal a truth, then it does not define a great university. One such asset under discussion is the management of parking facilities on our campus. To be frank, this issue uh, of, uh, of who uh, should own and manage the university's parking facilities has ruffled some feathers, as does any kind of proposal of change. As I think about it, we are in the business of ideas. That is what we do. We do not produce cars. We do not produce widgets. We are in the business of ideas. If an entity is not about ideas, then we ought not to be in that business, in my view. If we are not in the business, we, uh, this is it, we are not in the business of accumulating assets. We are in the business of creating ideas and assets. The bottom line is that thorny times call for practical pruning. I once described Ohio State as 18 colleges connected by a heating plant. <laughs> Today, I can honestly speak of one university. 
This is our goal, to be one institution. We are one university that works in common purpose, that moves in common direction, and that produces uncommon results. We are making strides to simplify how we operate. We are standardizing processes, identifying efficiencies, and leveraging the university's considerable purchasing power. Through campus-wide efforts, just to give one example, uh, to streamline procurement, financial travel, and, uh, financial travel and other processes, we are looking at major cost-saving projects that will generate $60 million in savings within, within the next three years, and then it will grow dramatically. Indeed, one of my goals for this university is nothing short of audacious, to grow and reallocate our assets by $1 billion in the next five years through expense management, process simplification, and revenue generation. Now, let me just say that again. I believe it is possible to redirect $1 billion for investment in the next five years with more diligent and dedicated stewardship of our resources. And that billion will go into teaching and learning and go into the fundamental core of the university. So ladies and gentlemen, I believe the 21st century challenge, uh, what I firmly believe will come to define educational excellence uh, around the globe, is the ability to maintain a firm grasp of the essential while reaching beyond what is known safe and comfortable. To, truly, the end game of our new approach to financing is about funding our present day priorities as well as our future aspirations. This means enhancing uh, student opportunities through curricular offer offerings, residential programming, and improved advising services. This means more funding for student scholarships and student financial aid to ensure that deserving students have access to college, that they come because they can come not because they can afford to come. Last year, in fact, Ohio State awarded $98 million in institutional scholarships and grants. This means recruiting the best new faculty and relentlessly re-recruiting our current superb faculty members. We have extraordinary talent at Ohio State. I can say this. Um, I can say this absolutely. We have extraordinarily talented faculty. And, uh, and we cannot be, though, content to rest on those laurels. We have attracted some new stars from neurology and material science to history and English. And I can tell you that we continue, that we will and we want to continue to grow the size of our faculty. That is almost unheard of, by the way, in these days of dwindling budgets, but I believe it is essential in order to move closer to our potential as a land-grant university for the world. And while we are not in the business of construction, we are in the business of building first-class academic programs, which require first-rate facilities, research space, and laboratories for discovery and learning. To that end, we are working very closely with the governor and the legislature to seek relief from archaic regulations related to capital projects. The old construction laws, which stood for 137 years in the state of Ohio, uh, they were put in place before, before, uh, Mark Twain wrote Huckleberry Finn. Think about that. And they were made, they were put in place to build canals. We don't build those anymore. But kudos to our governor and legislature for passing recent construction reform that allows us as an institution to build faster and save millions each and every year. That is progress. That is thinking. More modern construction practices have proven successful in the public sector and in 49 other states. We were the last to do this. Ohio, Ohio, if it is going to lead, cannot afford to be left in the dust of the 19th century. Put simply, we cannot build a future with scaffolding from the past. Proceeds from the century bond will be used to fund $2 billion of capital expenditure projects on campus. Uh, in fact, we're building so much that I can't even get into my office. I'm a little irritated. Uh, <laughs> and of course, we're building a big bathtub called, uh, called our new hospital at our academic medical center. Uh, Resources will be used to build an interdisciplinary research facility for chemists and biomolecular um, engineers. We're doing that almost as we speak. Uh, but what I, uh, what I want to say is I said that Ohio State has to move and will move from excellence to eminence. Not only do I believe that this aspiration is wholly uh, realistic, I believe that it is our responsibility. I want to bring our intellectual expertise to bear on long-term issues that touch human beings everywhere. A university cannot and will not be an economic and global force without resources. And I propose that Ohio and Columbus will not shine unless Ohio State leads the way. So as I close my remarks, and, and I know uh, final is a wonderful word, um, as I close my remarks, I would like to share a recent story that illustrates the requisite benefits of town and gown. 
You may have heard, and you've been reading this in the New York Times, that New York City has launched a year-long competition to attract a major research university in order to galvanize growth in this technology sector. They, they talked to Stanford, they talked to a number of different places. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, Cornell University, one of the nation's only top research universities not located in an urban area, got the bid to build a technology campus on Roosevelt Island. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the point is New York City is trying to do what Columbus is already doing. I want to underscore that. To our mutual good fortune, the Ohio State University already is located in the heart of a major metropolitan area, the seat of state government, the home of Battelle, one of the world's leading research and development organizations. Ohio's capital city is equally fortunate to have a major research university in its own backyard in the center of its city with a premier academic medical center, superb colleges in business and engineering, and certainly researchers and scientists in every field imaginable. Working together, a world-class research university and a thriving metropolitan city, we must leverage our tremendous force, energy, vitality, innovation, and creativity as a catalyst for all of us. By the way, we look forward to welcoming Mayor Bloomberg and his team so that they can learn from us. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, uh, I believe the great universities of today and tomorrow will honor their histories while adapting to the future and as we say at Ohio State, time and change. That is always true, of course, but even more so in times of hardship and adversity. We must always be moving forward, adapting with agility to a world in perpetual motion and change. We must have the strength and character to make lasting changes that will ennoble us for generations to come. And when a sea changes upon us, as it surely is, um, we must be relentlessly bold to tack against prevailing winds. Saying that, I'm ready to take any questions. So and I gave a 45-minute speech in about 25 <laughs> minutes. I did you pretty did, well today, didn't I? You did a great job. I? You did a great job. Uh, CMC always allows time for uh, some questions from uh, the audience. Uh, we encourage you to uh, come up to the microphone uh, state your name uh, and uh, uh, tell us, uh, ask your question. We refrain from uh, uh, any long uh, political statements or, <laughs> or other such. Uh, and we got to tell you, we record all of this uh, for televised broadcast on ONN, and it's also streamed on our website and on the website of the, of the Columbus Metropolitan Library. So you go first. Mary Ann Potter Lewis, class of 86. Um, Mary Ann, how are you? I'm fine. I'd love tickets for uh, Sunday's game. Let me tell you uh, something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, um, yeah, we've got yeah. our donations are available. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which brings me as a lender in the real estate community um, in Columbus to my question. Um, we know that we're building for uh, sophomores on campus, and I wonder in terms of planning for uh, change in the campus community, whether or not we need to look at juniors at any point in time being housed at the university. You know, I, I, I told a very interesting story uh, just this morning, the fact that I met with our new football coach yesterday. Uh, the first thing he said, he said, he said, I want all of my football players uh, freshmen and sophomores live on campus. I'd love to have them live on campus all the time. He's, he's making the case for me. Uh, the answer is is the fact that we're moving very quickly to have freshmen and sophomores live on campus. The reason is it's not about, uh, it's not about our freshmen or sophomores uh, just living uh, on campus. It's about the fact that if you think, uh, if you think of students having 168-hour weeks, which most of them do, uh, and they spend 18 hours in class, it's about us now being their partner for 150 hours. The most important learning experience at a great American university is one in which uh, those 150 hours are spent uh, in partnership with those students. So that's the reason we're doing that. We also want to make certain that our students have a much stronger affiliation with the university so that our juniors and seniors uh, stay very close to the campus, that we continue to partner with our campus community to rebuild and to uh, revitalize our campus areas. So the answer is that um, let, me, let me get the sophomores on campus. Uh, to think about juniors and seniors is like planning the Normandy invasion. It would be, uh, <laughs> it would be, it would be a chore, uh, but we're, we will be the only a uh, major American public university to require both freshmen and sophomores to live on campus uh, in about three years. Thank you. Dr. Gee, uh, excuse me, uh, a lot has uh, changed since I went to college. 
Uh, I was surprised uh, when my daughter told me that I need her permission now to get a copy of her grades. Mm -hmm. And uh, she tells me she's a legal adult now with rights. And so I'm concerned about the construction of these new dorms with the students having these rights. Are, are you confident that uh, you'll always be able to mandate these students live in dorms? Uh, that's the reason we're moving them onto campus so they'll have no rights. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to be their record. father. It's on record now. <laughs> I'm going to be their father, my friend. Uh, no, I, uh, I think that, uh, no, you, you know, the, the, the thing, uh, let, 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 me, let me just tell you something very interesting. Um, I'm going to tell you Vanderbilt. Mike, Mike Kehoe is, is here. I, I'll tell you a Vanderbilt story. When I came to Vanderbilt, and uh, very rarely do I tell stories about other institutions, uh, uh, but when I came to Vanderbilt in, in, in 2000, I received about 800 to a, to 1,000 emails about the fact that the alcohol policy was absurd and, uh, and that they were, they were uh, managing to the few instead of to the many and a variety of other things. So I called in the students and I said, hey, look, you know, uh, uh, let's do this. Why don't you design an alcohol policy and you enforce it and we'll be your partner. We'll treat you like adults. And they did, never received another email about it. By the way, their policy was much more stringent than the university's policy. The point is this, is the fact that I think that the world has changed. I believe that 18 and 19 year olds, when treated like adults, act like adults. And when we, when we treat them as partners, that they form a uh, valiant effort to make the university and their lives better. So it's not about their rights or our rights, it's about that partnership. Uh, Dr. J, our Vice President for uh, Student of, uh, Life is here, uh, does a wonderful job of creating that partnership. So that's what we're about. What we're, we're about now, the issue of uh, young adults becoming uh, committed citizens, and we hope that this is the process that we're going through right now. Thanks, You're welcome. President Key, I'm Kathy Fox. I'm an alumna of the same program as Eddie George a couple years earlier. And Landscape architecture. That's correct. Um, my question has to do with um, one of your other recent um, appointments as uh, chairing the committee that's going to help all the state universities uh, decide how state capital funds will be uh, distributed and uh, wanted to congratulate you on that and ask if you might have any interesting stories to tell about um, how that process is going. Well, uh, you know, uh, first of all, let me say that the governor's a very clever man. He knew that if he, if he made me the chair that I couldn't lobby on, uh, uh, on behalf of this issue. I had to be more ecumenical and, uh, 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 and that uh, the, the truth is the fact that I think it's a bold move. I believe that what we have done in higher education in this state for a long time is we've whined and complained. We've said that the state is over, uh, is over regulating, that they're bureaucratic, that they, that they don't give us any, any opportunity to be responsible, that we have all these layers. And so the governor threw down the gauntlet. He said, well, um, why don't you take in charge on this capital budget of how you're going to work together, how you're going to collaborate? I believe that this is both a, I believe that this is both uh, a, a battle and a, and a war. The battle is this, if we as institutions, instead of taking great pride in, um, in uh, uh, isolating ourselves from each other, if we can learn to cooperate and do this in a way, we'll all be better. The boat, the boat, boat will go up. So that's, so, so that's the battle. The war is this, if we prove to the people of this state that we can have freedom with responsibility and we can act responsibly, then we make the case that yes, not only is construction reform uh, possible, but give us the opportunity to make other kinds of uh, other kinds of decisions which we make better at the campus level but we do it in a way in which we're responsibly working with each other and and the final thing is this is it includes everyone and we need to understand that, that higher education is no longer about Ohio State or is no longer about Ohio University or is no longer about uh, Columbus uh, State it's about all of us it's about K through life and that continuum in which we all make a contribution and uh, so I'm 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 uh, I was a little leery about the fact that as the president of Ohio State, I was asked to do this. Uh, uh, the truth of the matter is, is, as I think about it, I think it is a bold opportunity for us to make our case for a different future for higher education in the state. So I'm looking forward to making it happen. Thank you. You're welcome. David. <laughs> president Gee, David Chesborough, COSI. Um, you've talked about the full state, but uh, being one of your partners, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you see the relationship, you know, the town gown, the relationship between the university and the central Ohio region and how that advances. Well, uh, let me say, uh, you, you start at home. 
our relationship with COSI is one of the most vital that we have, and, and you're not just up here to get an advertisement because David is, David is a great partner. But I think of Alex Fisher over here. I think of the Columbus Partnership. I think of my friends at Battelle. You know, think about, think about this, David. Think about the assets that we have. And you know, I made that little joke about Bloomberg, but the truth of the matter is that's precisely where we are. We are in a unique spot in America in this, in this age right now. You have one of the world's most important universities, and that's what we are, whether we whether, whether we want to accept that uh, mantle or not, that is exactly what we are. We're next to state government. We're two miles from state government. We have the largest, most important private research facility in America called, um, called Battelle. They do, by the way, no one, uh, no one really understands this. Battelle does 80% of the basic research done in energy in this nation. Think about the importance. And if we have, and finally we figured out that, that government, that COSI, that the partnership, that Battelle, that all of our partners here, if we work together, what we do is we tr create a significant, powerful force. The way that I like to think about it is the way that I like to think about the university. When we had these 18 colleges all kind of floating around, they were kind of like PT boats. They were shooting each other. Uh, it, you know, it was, it was kind of like the Polish army or something. I have no idea what it was. <laughs> oh, who, who did I, who did I embarrass now? You, d you did it again. I'll, 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 you I'll did it again. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be raising, I'll be raising money for Poland now. Uh, anyway, anyway, uh, anyway, but, 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 but the, way, the way that I like to think about it is you move from a PT boat to an aircraft carrier. And the aircraft carrier, if you can get the aircraft carrier moving in the same direction, and that is not simply the university, that's all of the assets that we're talking about. If we're an aircraft carrier, we move to the blue waters, everyone else is on the side looking at each other, and we will get up ahead of steam that no one will be able to compete with. I honestly believe that this region at this time, in the center of this country, and by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you just a conversation that I, that I had about a year ago or so, uh, 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 the head of the Fed was sitting right next to me. And, uh, and we had the, the chairman of, uh, of uh, IBM and the chairman of Ford. And he turned to me and he said, you know something? He said, the economic renaissance in this country is going to start right here. Now, he knew something that, that I didn't, but, I, but, but if he says that, I'm going to believe him on this particular issue. So I think that that's what we have to understand. We have spent too long. You know, one of the things that so frustrates me about Ohio, and I'm now a born again, born again Ohioan twice, <laughs> well, the thing that frustrates me is our damn Midwestern modesty. You know, these guys in New York, they talk about stuff and they're going to float off into the end of the world and California can't govern itself. And here we sit. In the, mid in the center of this country with great Midwestern values, and we have the most important asset that Ohio has is uh, Ohioans who would love to move back here, and if we keep them here, we'll build a picket fence and keep all our talented people here, and then we get Ohioans to move back here, we will be the most powerful engine in this country. Thank you. No way to say that. Okay, thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Uh, hello, President Gee. My name Hi. is Clay Reisinger, and I am a proud student at the Fisher College of Business. Hi. And don't worry, my class doesn't start till 3:30. Um, but <laughs> I do right. have a. Uh, Are you paying your tuition? That's all. I, I am. am. <laughs> I am. Okay, I am. Um, but my uh, question concerns the sophomore rule. Uh -huh. uh, because college students who live in dorms cannot keep cars on campus, are you aware that imposing the sophomore rule will make it harder for sophomores to find good paying jobs off campus? Now, I'm already a poor college student, so uh, I feel like it could make it worse. Yeah. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, uh, you know, our thoughts is the fact that we have to, we therefore have to think about ways to make it so oh. that you'll be, uh, so you'll have opportunity to take those off uh, campus. And, and in other words, don't, do not throw out the baby in the bathwater. That would be my point. So therefore, moving sophomores onto campus is a great opportunity for us to intellectually create you know, one of the most lively atmospheres in America. So therefore, we figure out ways to make that happen. Dr. J's right behind you. Raise your hand, Dr. J. Solve his problem, okay? <laughs> okay, there you go. Go, t go talk to her right before class, as a matter of fact. But, but, and, and, and one of the reasons that we're going through this process right now, and Dr. J will tell you that, is because of the fact that we have a whole set of student focus groups so that we understand, as we move to this, what problems or what issues we're going to confront so therefore we solve them bef before we uh, before we start the uh, before we start the final process I will I will note that by the way uh, because I think that is a great question I really do uh, the other the other point that I'd make to you is the fact that w we took three years to move to semesters we're, we're moving to semesters as you know 
And the reason we took three years, not because we couldn't do it, you know, you can, converge, uh, you can convert quarter hours to semester hours rather easily. And we could do it with a computer and we could have done it in a year. But we wanted to rethink the whole nature of teaching and learning, the curricular structure. My colleagues here uh, in charge of the faculty have done a magnificent job of totally thinking about ourselves as not, no longer being a, a university of the 1980s, but being the leading edge 21st century university. And so it's that kind of planning that will lead us to be able to answer your question in a couple of years. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yes, President Gee, my name is John McKnight, and uh, normally when I get up to the microphone, I'm kind of worried about uh, inappropriate remarks and things like that, and I wanted to thank you for kind of breaking the ice on that. <laughs> um, thank you. Puts me at ease. Thank you. More here. Thank you. That's, uh, um, that, 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 that's my brother from another mother. Uh, <laughs> Um, I've made my career in the collision repair industry, and, uh, and, and what I'm seeing uh, happening is, as a skilled trade industry, we're, we're losing our incoming uh, workforce. Um, I think the more technical the world gets, um, the more a higher education comes into play, and a lot of the skilled trades, um, I think, are suffering a little bit now. Um, and in this specific economy, some of the skilled trades industries are a little slow, and so there are some workers out there kicking around looking for work. Um, but as that generation ages out especially, there's not that many new people coming in. Yeah. Uh, would the university consider expanding its curriculum um, to help support skilled trades, train in skilled trades, and bring people into that segment of the, of the workforce? You know, I think that's a, I think that's a fabulous question because it, it makes a, a broader point. That is a fact that first of all, our governor, our governor uses this figure all the time that there are 70,000 jobs wanting for skilled uh, people right now in this state. In other words, we do not have a, we do not have a deficit uh, in terms of uh, jobs. We have a deficit in terms of skills and ability for people to take jobs. And I think that's an important point. So what I will tell you, what we will do as a university, we have a particular role to play, there, but there are multiple roads to salvation in a biblical sense. And by that, I mean what we do is we have to learn, and I want to come back to that notion of partner or parish. We now have to partner with our friends in, in terms of uh, uh, in the community colleges and the technical schools, a variety of other areas, so that we provide opportunities for us to create ideas and for them to create jobs through what they're doing. And it's that partnership rather than um, than than us than us doing it ourselves because we're not very good at that. We're good we're good at we're good at uh, solving the problems of equations and we're wonderful at uh, discovering the cure for cancer. But in terms of some of those things, other people are are better, and we need to acknowledge and work and make that happen. That's the partnership that I'm talking about. And by the way, the most important partnership that you and I both need to worry about is we need to improve the quality of public education in the state. That will make a real difference. So I appreciate the question very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm Jane Scott, Executive Director of the Metropolitan Club. Thank hey, you. Hey, Jane, you told me it was going to be an easy play. No, tough yeah. questions. Thank you very much. You lie, my dear. You, you, you've done well. You've done very well. Um, I'm a proud graduate of Ohio State in agriculture. Thank you. And uh, one thing, you are a partner of, with the Metropolitan Club. I take every opportunity to thank you and to thank other staff members for the civic engagement class where the students uh, have a four credit class and come down to the Metropolitan Club every Wednesday. So we're looking forward to uh, putting some energy into that in, in the spring. My question uh, is regarding the immigrant students, the uh, international students. Um, I, we talk many times about trying to keep international uh, people in general in the United States. Is there something that the universities who have large enrollments in uh, international students can do to facilitate green cards and opportunities for those students to stay in the United States yeah. rather than uh, thus exporting so much of that talent back to other countries? Uh, I, you know, if I were king for a day, if I were, uh, had the ability, I would do, I would require two things. In fact, I am king on this one, and we're doing it, uh, to, to require every one of our students to have a passport, which is the driver's license of the world. Uh, that is the future. We have to do that. The second thing is if I were king for a day, what I would do is I'd have the ability to, to staple a green card to every one of our international students when they cross that stage. Yeah. Because think about this. Think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Think about Google. Think about Facebook. Think about go on down the line. Almost every one of those, uh, almost every one of those really forward-thinking places uh, or, and companies 
have uh, international uh, components to them, students who came here and then created those. So we do need to take full advantage of that. By the way, it doesn't mean to say that they should stay here always. It means to say that then we need to have that partnership. We have, off uh, we have, off uh, we have opened an office in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. We will open one in Mumbai in, uh, in March. We will open one in, in Sao Paulo and then one in Istanbul because of the fact that we want the world to come to Ohio, but we want to take the, uh, Ohio to the world. And so I think that's very important. Um, so listen, I think I think we're about over. I, I think we're. I think yeah. We're let, let me out. let me do one thing. Can I just do this? This sure. is just yeah. fun because I want to do that right on the end, and I, I've got one minute to do this. Uh, <laughs> this is one of my favorite things, because I think that what we're all about right now. I think we're about. I think we're all about understanding that the world has changed, and we're all about questioning about how things are done. So I'm going to read a little story, and I'll just leave this as something for you to think about. A new monk arrives in the monastery and is assigned to work with the other monks, copying ancient texts by hand. He sits down to start writing and notices that the monks are not working from the original manuscript, but are making copies from copies. This concerns the new monk, so he goes to the head monk and explains that if there was an error in the first copy, that error would be continued in all the subsequent copies. The head monk smiles at the new monk and says, My son, we have been copying from copies for centuries. It is how things are done here at the monastery. But if it makes you feel better, I will go down to the cellar to check one of the copies against the original. So the head monk goes down to the cellar. Hours pass and nobody sees him. After a while, the new monk gets worried and heads downstairs to find him. Hearing sobbing coming from the back of the cellar, the new monk finds the head monk leaning over one of the original manuscripts crying. What's wrong? What's wrong? Asks the new monk. The head monk looks up, tears in his eyes. The word is celebrate. <laughs> You're right, Buzz. He, he leaves it with a smile. Thank you, Dr. Gee. Come back often. Uh, the rest of the phrase is, I'll firm thy friendship, Ohio. And thank all of you, Buckeyes and others, for coming here today. We'll continue the conversation out in the lobby, if you like. There are some cookies and coffee. Thanks to Bob Weiler and the Weiler Organization and Porter Wright. Thank you.